I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon, welcome. Um, we have a guest speaker whom I, I'm going to introduce in a second. Before I do so, um, I have to say that um, this lecture is part of a class, uh, actually uh, Jean Monnet Chair, I hold at the University of Trento, uh, called the European Union and the Western Balkans, Enlargement and Resilience. Within that context, I have the opportunity to have uh, um, to invite uh, guest speakers and, um, and, and today it is a real pleasure to have with us Daniela Lai, um, who is a lecturer in international relations at Royal Holloway, University of London. Her research deals with post-war justice with a focus on socio-economic issues and political economy. Uh, she also has an interest in methods, fieldwork and research ethics. Her book, Socioeconomic Justice, International Intervention and Transition in Post-War Bosnia-Herzegovina, was published in 2020, so very recently, by Cambridge University Press. Um, I think I can add, I just finished reading the book, it's a real pleasure and very interesting um, in your um, uh, Moodle page, you have um, um, the opportunity to read a chapter of that book, chapter 5, uh, and, um, and I strongly invite you to, to do so. Um, Daniela, um, Daniela's lecture is titled The Political Economy of War and Post-War Justice in Bosnia, and um, as always, for us at least, um, this lecture is going to be taped so, and then will be posted on the website of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Trento. So, I have, I'm sorry, I have to remind everyone that for reason of privacy, if you, uh, you can ask questions at any time, you can um, turn on your video if you want, uh, identify yourself, etc., etc. And if you do so, you accept to be. Um, to appear in the video. Um, I think this is everything I, I, I'm supposed to say. Daniela, thank you again for being with us and, uh, and uh, I, I guess I, I give you the, 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 the opportunity to start. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Roberto, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will just share my screen so you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Is that okay? Can you see the slides? Uh, okay. For me, it's perfectly fine. I hope okay. it's for Perfect. So thank you again for inviting me, um, Roberto, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here and uh, give this lecture on the political economy of the war and post-war justice in uh, Bosnia. I would have, as I said uh, to him earlier, I would have definitely liked to be in Trento in person, but uh, I guess we have to uh, adapt to the circumstances um, so here's a brief outline of the lecture. I will um, go through a very brief overview of the war in Bosnia, and I will actually specifically focus on themes and issues that are particularly relevant for the topic of the lecture. So I will not talk a lot about the um, military aspect of the war, uh, but I will, I will give some suggestions on uh, for things you can read um, about some of the issues I will mention in this brief overview. Uh, I will then spend a little bit more time talking about the key features of the political economy of the Bosnian war. Uh, as political economy I will uh, discuss in this lecture is an essential aspect uh, for understanding not only the war, but also violence during war and also post-war justice, so after the conflict is over. Uh, and in doing so, I will partly draw on the research that was published in the book that Roberto just mentioned, uh, but I will also draw on more relevant literature. Um, and as you know, also Roberto has published uh, on topics related to Bosnia and state building and peace building quite a, uh, a lot. So um, I'll mention his work as well. Um, okay, so to start with this section on the Bosnian war, um, the, I will actually take a little step back to the dissolution of uh, the Socialist um, um, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. 
Uh, and again, this is a topic that is the subject of a lot of debates in, um, in academic literature by historians who have studied the dissolution of, uh, of Yugoslavia. But what I want to highlight here is that much scholarship, much of this scholarship actually talks about the existence of an overlap between political and economic weaknesses that characterized the life of the, um, of the Federation in the past, in the last few decades of its existence. So the socialist Yugoslav economy, as you may know, was um, relatively more open towards the West compared to the communist economies um, of other Eastern European countries that were beyond the Iron Curtain. Um, it, so because of this, it was also more affected by economic developments and economic crisis that were going on globally, like, for example, the oil crisis of 1973. Um, and during this time from the 1970s, um, as economic difficulties started, the Yugoslav government also started to borrow. There is an, an increase in the uh, debt uh, of the government, of the state, and this debt is then refinanced through loans that Yugoslavia is able to take from international financial institutions, especially the International Monetary Fund. And of course, then the IMF in return for these loans asks for reforms. Uh, what was called, uh, is called structural adjustment, which marks basically the beginning of the end of the socialist economy. Um, and in the immediate term, however, the, neither the loans or the reforms actually fix the economy. We have a period uh, of devaluation of the Yugoslav dinar, uh, hyperinflation, and also growing unemployment. So what happens with these um, economic crisis is also that the existing disparities within Yugoslavia uh, become a lot more evident. So we have uh, the northern part of the country, especially Slovenia and parts of Croatia that are economically uh, more developed and wealthier, and poorer parts of the country, especially in the south, um, in Kosovo, for example, uh, and also parts of Bosnia, which is relevant for um, for our topic for today. So at the same time as this economic crisis, we also have uh, political changes. So politically, the, we have the um, approval of a new constitution in 1974. And this constitution is generally seen as a constitution that further decentralizes power away from the central federation and towards the constituent republics of the former Yugoslavia. Um, and so in this case, what this means, according to some scholars, is that there was less of an ability to carry out reforms at federal level. And some argue that this led to um, some structural weaknesses in, um, in Yugoslavia. Um, and so at the same time, we also have a political crisis with citizens losing trust in the system. We have uh, demands for democratization, and we also have, uh, because of, also of the a poor economic situation, uh, a higher and higher number of uh, social protest workers uh, protesting, for example, um, in various parts of the country. Um, and this process then uh, culminates with the uh, acceptance towards the end of the 1980s that there have to be this kind of democratizing reforms including holding uh, multi-party elections, which then happens at the beginning of the 90s. So I will say a little bit more about this with reference to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina specifically in the next slide. So uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina within Yugoslavia was also undergoing a similar dynamics of economic and political crisis and a crisis of political legitimacy. Um, there is one example that probably really symbolizes this um, crisis, and that is the so-called agro-commerce scandal. Um, this was basically a very large food processing business, um, which was located in, the, in northern Bosnia in the area of a town called Velika Kladusha near Bihać. Um, and these firms had, this firm had been employing thousands of people in the area. And it was, uh, it was discovered during the uh, 1980s, there was this scandal um, that it, the company had been financing itself with false promissory notes. And this uh, scandal had implicated uh, the uh, person who was then heading the company, uh, a man called Fikret Abdic. 
uh, and I mention this specifically now because it will come up later when I talk a little bit more about the political economy of the war itself, because he will then become a key figure in the conflict in this area of northwestern Bosnia. So this scandal is, um, I mentioned this in here because it, it is part of um, this process of, kind of losses of trust and crisis of legitimacy of the system. Uh, and this also created a situation where political elites were um, trying to exploit this crisis. So the economic and the political crisis to build support for ethnically based political parties ahead of the first multi-party elections. Um, so in the meantime, we already have um, um, conflicts breaking out uh, following the declarations of independence in Slovenia and Croatia. And then in Bosnia, we have these multi-party elections. And as you can see from the table, which shows a, a census data from the Yugoslav census of 1989, 1991, sorry, um, where uh, you can see from this table that Bosnia was a quite mixed country from a, the point of view of ethnicity and the table uses the, um, the kind of uh, descriptions of ethnicity that were used in that census. So there was also an option for people to, um, to mark themselves as Yugoslav and that was something that um, a, you know, a good number of people were starting to do actually towards that, uh, that time, uh, increasingly so. Uh, but the country was really mixed between a uh, Bosnian Muslim population, Bosnian Croat and Bosnian Serbs. Um, and so when the multi-party elections are held, we have ethno-nationalist parties, the SDA uh, for um, mostly Bosnian Muslim party, SDS um, uh, led by Radovan Karadzic, uh, Bosnian Serb, and the HDZ, the Bosnian Croat, nationalist Bosnian Croat party, that end up um, the emerging as the winners um, from these elections. So uh, this is followed by an independence referendum in 1992 um, and which a referendum that is actually uh, that the SDS uh, and Karadzic uh, boycott and call for uh, Bosnian Serbs to boycott the referendum. But the independence as an option wins the referendum, the independence is then declared, uh, and shortly after the war starts. Uh, and we're talking here at uh, end of March, beginning of April 1992, and then the conflict will last until the end of 1995. So as I said, I will not really go into um, the actual dynamics of the war. Um, we can, you know, maybe if you have specific questions, we can talk about that later. Uh, but from the point of view of the human cost of the war, we have to bear in mind that this was, as you probably know, a war that is known for widespread violence against civilians. Uh, and a lot of attention has been uh, focused on certain key events that were that are still um, sort of remembered as a key event in the Bosnian war, including the longest siege in modern warfare, which is the siege of Sarajevo, where 10,000 people died, uh, as well as um, the genocide in Srebrenica, where 8,000 um, civilians were killed. Um, and overall, uh, about 100,000 people were killed in the war. Um, so, just to give you a sense of some of the readings that you might want to do to learn more about the aspects of the war I mentioned now, um, uh, on the political economy of the Yugoslav dissolution, there is this book by Susan Woodward, uh, who also wrote another book called Ban Balkan Tragedy, which is probably more famous. But this book, Socialist Unemployment, gives a quite good uh, description of what is happening in Yugoslavia um, during its, this last decades before, before its dissolution. Then um, if you're interested in reading more about the Yugoslav wars of the 90s in general, um, Catherine Baker's book uh, is really excellent, not only because of if, if you wanted like a short overview, but also because it has a really amazing thematic bibliography at the end if you, to do further research. So I always recommend it to students. Um, and then on Srebrenica, this book by my 
uh, PhD supervisor Lara Nettlefield with uh, Sarah Wagner uh, and uh, a book on the siege of Sarajevo, which is also quite well known by Ivana Maciek. Um, this is just like some of the sources on these topics that if you were interested in reading more about the war. So to give a, a sort of snapshot of what happens then at the end of the war, uh, leading us into the second section on the political economy of the conflict. Um, so the war was brought to a military end in 1995, um, also thanks to the intervention of NATO. When after NATO starts bombing um, Bosnian Serb positions around Sarajevo and other parts of the country, the war comes to an end uh, relatively quickly. Um, and then we have the signing of a peace agreement, um, the so-called Dayton Peace Agreement, because it was uh, signed there. Um, and the Dayton Peace Agreement is said by a lot of scholars to have sort of crystallized the situation as it was at the end of the war. So just like the war had divided the country um, uh, into different parts, depending on who was uh, controlling that area from a military point of view. So did the peace agreement um, kind of fix that division on paper. Uh, and in the end, so it is um, a lot of people claim that the peace agreement, yes, it put a, a, a stop to the fighting and, and the killings, uh, but at the same time also rewarded uh, these military gains that were achieved through uh, the conflict. So as part of the peace agreement, uh, one of the annexes of the peace agreement was then the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and the constitution sets up a power sharing system because between the three so-called constituent peoples, which in the constitutions are called Bosniaks or, or Bosnian Muslims, um, Serbs and Croats. And the par as part of this power sharing system, there is also the establishment of these two entities the uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have a majority Bosnian Croat um, uh, population, Bosnia or Croat population, and in um, Republika Srpska, a majority Serb population. Uh, and also a district of Birchko that was autonomous, that was also created with the, uh, with the constitution. Um, and the peace agreement and the constitution, they also, uh, set up this very far reaching state building intervention. And I mean, you have a really uh, expert on this uh, here teaching you on this course. Um, and, and it's generally considered to be relatively silent on economic issues. This is something that people have written that the constitution focuses more on this power sharing and political issues uh, and not so much on the uh, economic reconstruction. However, um, the preamble of the constitution does explicitly call for um, a country to Bosnia to be, be kind of set up as a country that is founded on a commitment to an open market economy and the recognition of private property. So it's a clear mark, it's a clear difference from um, uh, socialism. Uh, and also it provides for the creation of some of the key economic institutions. Um, in the country after the war, and that is the central bank, um, the creation of a new currency, and all of these things are uh, to be done according to the constitution under the guidance of international organizations and especially the IMF. Um, so this is from the point of view of you know the constitution and what why it matters and how it. Um, sets up the post-war period. One of the things that it also, um, that the constitution is also uh, said to be responsible for is the continued political relevance of ethno-nationalist parties after the war. So the parties that had first gained, gained popularity in the first multi-party elections will continue to have influence and political power after. Um, and it also facilitates the uh, um, creation and the reinforcing of very close links between um, political elites and economic elites that are gaining power after having accumulated wealth during the war and after the war, especially through the privatization process. So then in the second part of the lecture, as I said, I'm going to talk a, a bit more in depth about the political economy of the Bosnian war and 
also about socioeconomic violence, which is this um, topic that I discuss in uh, the book and especially in the chapter that uh, Roberto mentioned that I sent um, for you to, to read if you're interested. So first I want to say a, a few words about what are these key features or, or more generally of the political economy of the war in Bosnia. So one of the first international reactions when the war break, broke out um, was actually the impositions of international sanctions and uh, of an arms embargo. Uh, and this was not just imposed on Bosnia, it was imposed on all former Yugoslav republics. And um, it kind of ended up having gave, giving an advantage from a military point of view to um, those who were able to keep control of the Yugoslav military or the GNA. Uh, and especially then uh, Serbia that had kept kind of most of uh, control of most of these military assets. Um, at the same time, what these sanctions and the embargo did was also to prompt other armed groups to resort to alternative sources of revenue, uh, such as trafficking and black markets in order to finance themselves and to arm themselves. Um, and as some authors have written, especially this book by uh, Peter Andreas that talks about Sarajevo in particular, um, the um, international presence in Bosnia ended up also being involved in some of these uh, forms of trafficking in a way or facilitating them. He calls it a symbiotic relationship. Um, and um, there are also other important works such as um, that of Strazzari, who point out, point out that the war, even though different armed groups were fighting among them, this did not necessarily mean that there was no communication between them and that there weren't economic exchanges going on among these warring factions and groups, despite the fact uh, that they were fighting each other. So when there was an, an economic benefit or gain, these um, still facilitated this kind of trafficking, uh, regardless of which side you know, these groups were on in the war. Um, it was also common, and again, I, as I said, I, um, uh, I mentioned him earlier, uh, it was also common to take advantage of um, economic and political power to uh, gain advantage from a military point of view in the war. Uh, and especially we're talking here about this, um, the case that I'm talking about here is because it's just like a very striking example uh, of Fikret Abdic and the, our, who was the head of this uh, very large uh, food processing business, agrocommerce. Um, he basically was able to use all of the economic and political influence that he had accumulated through his position. And he also had political ambitions already at the time uh, and also take advantage of the strategic position of the town of Velika Kladusha and Bihać, which were at the junction of territories held by different factions. Uh, and it took this opportunity to uh, break away from the central government and establish his own uh, autonomous province of, um, um, of Western, sorry, autonomous province of Western Bosnia in 1993. Um, and then he started engaging in, you know, all these widespread trafficking practices with other factions. Uh, he was also found responsible for the war crimes committed against the Bosniaks who remained loyal to the Sarajevo government. And so he was convicted um, of these crimes by a court in Croatia. Um, however, then after he actually spent his sentence after the war, um, he came back to political life and uh, was uh, elected as mayor in his town. Um, so this again, I mentioned this because it's a very clear example of the political economy of the conflict and how it was based on also these forms of trafficking and the use of um, economic means to gain military advantage and uh, how this happened. Another uh, aspect of the of the war that I want to mention is that um, it caused clearly a lot of material destruction. So we had uh, the bombing, shelling of industries, uh, roads, bridges, 
And it's also estimated that up to two thirds of residential properties in the country were, that were either damaged or destroyed. Um, and by the end of the war, the industrial production has, has basically came, it basically come to a halt. Um, it had shrunk to 5% of the level that it was before the war. Um, the, so during this time, we have a, um, social property. So property in Yugoslavia was socially owned. Um, social property that was uh, used for military purposes, occupied, seized by various forces. And uh, also we had in 1993 uh, uh, steps taken by the government to nationalize uh, socially owned property as a first step towards privatizations that would happen in the post-war period. So because property was socially owned, for the government to then be able to sell it, it first had to take control of it and nationalize it. And this was also done um, with, while offering very little compensation to the citizens and workers who were former owners of this social property. Um, so the, we have this kind of widespread destruction. In the picture that you see here, um, this is the old town of Priedor. Um, and it's the area that is known as, as old town. Uh, but if you can see the picture on the screen, the houses there are actually all new. They have all been rebuilt after the war because during the war, the, the whole neighborhood was basically completely destroyed, run to the ground. Um, and this is just like one example um, from, from one town. But the destruction of uh, homes and uh, residential properties, as well as um, infrastructure, uh, was a really important aspect of, um, of the war. So then let me um, put these, like talk a little bit about how this political economy of the conflict played out in two cities in particular. So these are the two cities where I did a lot of the fieldwork for the research I write about in the book. Um, and the two cities are Priador and Zenica. So these are um, medium sized, I would guess, in, um, ter in Bosnian terms, let's say. Um, they are typical post industrial towns now. They both of, of these cities grew. Uh, in size, thanks to the investment that socialist governments made in the industrial sector in this area. Um, and before the war, they were also, both of them, fairly mixed from the point of view of um, the demographic composition. So if you can see uh, from the census of 1991, um, the population in Priador was um, largely Muslim and Serb with a also um, sizable Croat minority, as well as a group of people who declared themselves as Yugoslavs. Uh, the same was true in Zenica, um, in terms of the percentage of population that declared themselves as Yugoslav was actually quite high. Uh, and you also had a, a Muslim majority, but with very, very large groups of um, Croat and Serb minorities in the city. Um, and both of these cities, as I said, they became industrial centers in their area. Uh, in Priador, the main the industry that employed the most people, relatively speaking, was the mining of iron ore. Um, the mining company in Priador had, had about 8,000 employees, so that is a lot. And there were other factories like the, the paper mill, for example, that were also very large. Like the paper mill I had uh, based on the data, I have around 3,000 employees at its peak. Um, and in Zenica, the uh, largest employer, the main industry of the town really was the steel mill. Um, and the steel mill in Zenica employed in the, in, and the sort of the industries related to the steel mill altogether employed up to 20,000 people at the end of the 1980s. So that is a huge number. It means that basically, every family in the city had someone who worked there. Um, so both of these cities, um, I one of the reasons also, so I chose the, uh, to do fieldwork there is that um, I thought it was important to write about the Bosnian war from the perspective of cities that had undergone this transformation um, uh, because of their uh, status as kind of industrial centers and then 
what happened to them during and after the war in relation to the life of these industries. Um, and also because they were linked by these uh, steel production supply chain. So we had uh, um, the iron ore that was mined in Prilor was then sent through um, via rail to the steel mill in Zenica where it was turned into steel. Um, so then what happened in Prilor and Zenica during the war? Um, so generally speaking, the case of Prilor is actually quite well known in the literature on the Bosnian war for very tragic reasons. The city fell under control of the Bosnian Serb military and political elites very early on in 1992. And it would then become the site of some of the worst violence against civilians in the war. Um, So-called ethnic cleansing. So the um, displacement of communities um, based on their ethnicity. Uh, widespread killings of civilians, uh, imprisonment in camps and uh, torture. Um, and um, the, the example of Priador is uh, a very clear example of the seize, seizing of industrial assets for military purposes that is very closely linked to forms of violence. So in the case of Priador, in the chapter I title one section from factories to prison camps, because this is precisely what happened uh, to a lot of the industrial sites around the city. So in the picture there, uh, which is, I think the only picture um, in the slides that I didn't take, there's credits to the author uh, there. When you don't see them, that means I took them. Um, in the picture there, you can see um, this White House of Omaska, uh, which was a, a mine and it actually is again today uh, a mine uh, uh, which was then uh, at the time of the war um, turned into a camp for, uh, by the Bosnian Serb military uh, where killings and torture um, happened. Um, on the other hand, in Zenica, uh, we have this um, slightly different experience in the war because the factory and the city itself were kept under very strict control uh, from the uh, Bosnia, central Bosnian government. For military reasons, of course, the, um, the steel mill was important from a strategic point of view. Um, but of course, during the war, also the production of steel was shut down there as well, just like mining stopped in Priador. Uh, the conflict dynamics do not revolve uh, around ethnic cleansing as much as in Priador. We did have, like, the city was bombed. The, uh, some key parts of the city, especially, were shelled, like the market, the city center. Uh, but the city as a whole remained under control, like a sort of a stronghold of government forces in central Bosnia, where fighting was happening in um, areas and towns around. But the picture that you can see here on this slide shows you um, if you look on the on the far left, that is the uh, size of part of the steel mill compared to the size of the city. And so you can see that it's both, first of all, very close, like you can literally walk from the center of Zenica to the gates of the steel mill uh, very easily. And it's also almost as big as the urban center if you like, visit the area. Um, so then before talking about socioeconomic violence and how this is, uh, took place in these two cities of Priador and Zenica, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about how, like why is this political economy perspective important? Um, important, as I said, not just to understand the war in a more comprehensive way, but especially to understand wartime violence and post-war justice. Um, well, of course, it also mm, serves the purpose of avoiding very simplistic representations of the war and also of post-war politics uh, that are exclusively based around ethnicity. It complicates and makes a, it, uh, it makes us uh, gives us a more nuanced understanding of what was going on. Um, but there are also other important reasons. So, what first of all, we know that the literature on wartime violence and post-war justice. Um, has a quite specific focus, not only in Bosnia, but even in other cases of, um, of similar cases of conflicts, let's say, 
on um, violations that are uh, physical integrity crimes, like war crimes, cr uh, crimes against humanity and genocide, and that the processes that are then set up to deal with these kind of crimes as part of so-called transitional justice processes are also uh, aimed at redressing these kind of crimes very often through um, institutions like war crimes tribunals or truth commissions. But we see in the Bosnian case, as well as in other cases, especially in this time in the 90s, uh, dominance of legalistic approaches. And this um, gives us a very limited understanding of what violence means during war and also what justice means after. So if we limit our understanding of justice to legalistic forms of justice that come through the judgments of a war crimes court, for example. Uh, and that literature as a whole, the transitional justice literature has been relatively slow to address uh, kind of concerns about the socioeconomic aspects of wartime violence and post-war justice that instead actually become quite apparent if you talk to people who are affected by conflict in conflict affected contexts as, a, um, as the case of Bosnia shows. So again, why is it important to have this political economy perspective to understand wartime violence and post-war justice? This is because everything I've said just now, so the fact that the literature on wartime violence focuses on physical integrity crimes and transitional justice also does the same, um, means that political economy is very often just considered to be the sort of context or background within which events take place, within which violence is committed. Uh, and what I wanted to do with my work especially was to move a political economy from being just a background or context to something that is more, more than that, to something that actually structures the kind of violence that people experience. And so I, because I thought that this would be uh, more important in order to really capture the experiences of violence of many of these communities. Um, in places like Priador and Zenica. So in the book, I define socioeconomic violence as a kind of violence that is rooted in the political economy of the war, where political economy is not just a background. Um, and then this poses then also the question of how we deal with the consequences of this kind of violence when it happens. Um, and the, so what I will do in the rest of the presentation from now on is to First of all, discuss a little bit what socioeconomic violence meant in Priador and Zenica, uh, and also um, how transitional justice mechanisms that were um, set up in Bosnia were inadequate in um, dealing with socioeconomic issues, especially because many of the remedies and justice claims that were put forward by uh, people I spoke to in Priador and Zenica centered around the idea that there should be, that policies should be inspired by principles of redistribution that were not at the center of um, international concerns um, in uh, their international intervention after the war. So to talk a bit more about um, socioeconomic violence then. So what I'm arguing, I'm arguing here is that basically we should try to redefine what we mean by wartime violence to include the socioeconomic violence as part of it. And I'll begin here by, I usually tell this uh, story about what socioeconomic violence kind of felt like or was by, um, by telling the story of one of the interviewees that you can read also about in the chapter, like a woman in the book, whom in the book I call uh, Suada, who's a Bosnian Muslim and grew up in Priador and was employed at the mining company. And when um, interviewing her and she was telling me like, about her life in Priador and then how the war started for her in 1992, um, the, how the war started for her, the first experience of the war was when she was fired from her job at a mining company um, alongside all of the other um, non-Serb colleagues that she had. Um, and so she got this letter saying that she was fired. And from that moment, a lot of other things also started to change. So in the same period of time, uh, there was also uh, rules that were uh, approved to limit the freedom of movement 
uh, of um, uh, Bosnian Muslims um, preventing them from traveling freely uh, in and out of the city. The phone lines of um, the Bosnian Muslim neighborhoods were cut off um, and the mining company eventually shut down and the preparations were then made to turn some of the mines um, into detention camps. And so some of those uh, employees that had been working there ended up going back to the mines as detainees. Uh, and all of these um, preparations, all of these, um, the, the firing of, of people on the grounds of ethnicity, um, the um, limits to freedom of movement and communication, all of this was happening before the killings and before um, people were actually started to be expelled from their homes, which also happened um, not long after that. But it was really the very first experience of the conflict on a personal level. Uh, and it was uh, one that you know, was felt by this specific interviewee, but if, as you can read in the book, it was one that a larger number of people shared, and it's actually an experience that people shared also in other cities, not just in Prijedor. Uh, however, it's also a kind of experience of um, wartime violence that is not really recorded in transitional justice frameworks or acknowledged because it does not fit the categories of violence and the categories of justice that are given in these very restrictive legalistic definitions. Um, in the case of Zenitsa, um, we also have uh, unfair dismissals. Um, it was less common for this to happen on the grounds of ethnicity, but it still happened. Uh, on um, grounds, for example, that people had left the city uh, for too long during the conflict, which a lot of people did when they um, wanted to, for example, some of the interviewees fled to Croatia not long after the war had started, um, to especially taking part of the family there um, to be safe. Uh, also, the war in Zenita um, was really characterized by the very high level of material deprivation. So the people who before had lived in the city in relatively comfortable lives, who had jobs at the steel uh, mill, ended up really suffering from um, lack of food, starvation, lack of really basic necessities that um, um, they struggle to access even through humanitarian aid. Um, and then we also see the kind of long-term protracted consequences of what happened during the war, especially in Zenica. Um, so we can see the fact, for example, that, um, so the steel mill stopped production, of course, uh, and after the war, it was privatized. Uh, the majority of it was sold to a multinational corporation called ArcelorMittal, which also bought part of the mines in Priador later. Um, and the well, when production was restarted, they also this also brought back uh, a very serious problem of air pollution, and air pollution became um, a really dangerous hazard to the lives of people in Zenita, and it still is. Uh, and the end of the war and the privatization also brought with with this um, the a lack of accountability because the government said. The government basically did not take responsibility for this. Uh, the company also um, tries to uh, avoid that. And this creates a situation where the struggles around air pollution have been now going on in Zenica for about a decade, basically. Um, so these kinds of um, these kinds of experiences of the war and also their um, protracted consequences into the aftermath of the war, bring people in cities like Prieto and Zenica to have claims to forms of justice that are related to socioeconomic issues. So claims that have to do, for example, to regaining uh, jobs that were lost due to being fired on the grounds of ethnicity or other uh, unfair grounds or compensation for these kinds of dismissal. Uh, and also the uh, expectations and claims to support for the reintegration of returnees. I'll say a little bit more about this later when we talk about transitional justice measures specifically. But also they expected a more active involvement of the state 
in supporting economic policies that would help achieve this kind of redress. And so, so, so justice in this sense for people in Zenith and Priodor, it didn't just mean bringing war criminals to trial, it also meant socioeconomic justice and it meant redistribution. Uh, but as I said, these ideas did not fit with the idea of transitional justice that was promoted um, internationally and in Bosnia. And at the same time, it also clashed with internationally sponsored economic reforms after the war. So moving then into this part on post-war justice, what do I mean when I say that these socioeconomic issues didn't fit with the approach of transitional justice? So transitional justice broadly understood is this set of processes that deals with the consequences of wartime violence or violations that are committed uh, by authoritarian regimes. Um, and while these kind of definitions are, is, is quite open to different possibilities in terms of mechanisms that can be set up, actually in practice, there has been um, a dominance of um, what as I have called the legalistic approaches. In the case of the former Yugoslavia, this was particularly evident as one of the main ways that the international community found to deal with this issue of um, war crimes and um, dealing with the past was the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And you can see uh, the uh, ICT's ICT's own uh, statistics about what they did. But because as you can see, um, the ICTY was a setup to only to deal with those considered to be most responsible for uh, violence against civilians and war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, actually, a lot of these war crime trials in the former Yugoslav region ended up happening at the domestic level. So many more um, defendants appeared in front of um, courts in Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia and so on then at the ICTY, uh, which only indicted uh, 161 uh, individuals. So transitional justice in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, not only, so aside from the ICTY and domestic trials that I've just mentioned, the transitional justice was also part of a broader and more complex state building intervention that um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but it included international support for some other types of measures as well. Um, one of them was the search for missing persons, uh, which actually still goes on today as they're trying to identify remains uh, found in mass graves, for example. Um, then there is the question of refugee return and property restitution. Uh, and actually, Robert also wrote a really um, interesting article on Predator specifically on this. So they, the Dayton Agreement actually guaranteed or gave the right uh, to uh, Bosnians to have um, to return not only to Bosnia after the war, but also to return to their area, to the place of origin within Bosnia. And so a, a commission then was set up to adjudicate property claims, um, which was also entitled to give compensation, but actually mostly dealt with confirming property rights and facilitating the return of refugees um, that were to their homes. So the, rest, the restitution of homes to their owners. Um, but the return was understood again, in a different way by these international strategies that saw you know, the, the key of the issue to, was to um, give the possibility to people to go back to their actual homes. Um, and what the uh, refugees and returnees understood to be the issue, which was actually facilitating a return to a more normal pre-war life, like their life had been before the war started. And in this sense, um, the, there was actually very little support for returnees. So as Roberto wrote in the article on Priador, a lot of the return on Priador was um, returnees came back because they were determined to come back more than thanks to the support of uh, international policies that facilitated this return. Um, and so all of these, any kind of hope they had for uh, support for socioeconomic reintegration, getting their jobs back or facilitating other types of employment, this didn't really materialize. And so they ended up being very isolated within their community. And these, or uh, for example, they ended up leaving again. Um, 
Another policy that was also uh, supported uh, as part of a, a way of dealing with the consequences of the war um, were uh, payments to victims. Uh, and actually what the, we could call them reparations, but actually as uh, uh, Jesse Kronesova has argued in uh, her article from 2016, they're um, better called war related payments because they are a kind of hybrid between welfare payments and reparations. And this is also because they are paid not only to, they're not payments to victims only, they also include payments to war veterans. Uh, and actually the system as it was set up privileges payments to veterans. Uh, veterans are entitled to higher payments compared to civilian victims who also have to prove a higher level of um, disability in order to claim. Um, and also for a long time, it also put victims of sexual violence as, at a disadvantage. Um, so all of these mechanisms that form part of the common um, transitional justice approach, so which uh, payments that we could call sort of reparations, even though they weren't really reparations, um, refugee return, um, uh, trials, they were not really um, adequate mechanisms to deal with the legacies of the kind of socioeconomic violence I mentioned earlier. Um, so this was, it's one side of the problem. The other side of the problem is that not only were the consequences of socioeconomic violence not dealt with through transitional justice, but they were also to an extent worsened by economic reforms. So economic reforms and post-war justice are very often considered to be two separate um, areas of intervention. So even if you go and look within the international organizations that work um, on both of these issues, the departments that deal with these things are normally separate. They don't really, it's like a sort of silos. They work, you know, quite separate way. And even in the literature, um, at least for a, for a long time, maybe now it, it's changing because there is more and more writing about socioeconomic issues and transitional justice, but there is this kind of ass assumption that they are separated. Um, however, what one of the things that I was really trying to do in, in my work was to show how they're connected in the sense that the economic reforms that were in, um, implemented after the Bosnian war had a clear impact on the legacies of socioeconomic violence and the possibilities for socioeconomic justice. Um, so the organizations involved in these kind of reforms were um, actually quite varied. Um, so in addition to financial institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, um, also we had the European Bank for Construction and Development, uh, but also uh, in the institutions such as the OHR, uh, so the Office of the High Representative was uh, involved in some of these, especially when it comes to pension reform. Uh, the European Union in more recent times, especially um, tried to um, promote certain uh, economic uh, agendas for reform together with the World Bank and the IMF. So it is really um, part of this international intervention in Bosnia. Um, and I have, I focus in the book on these three, on three aspects of uh, these economic reforms and the transition to a market economy. Um, and again, for all three of these, we can clearly trace um, a connection to uh, some of the consequences of the socioeconomic violence I talked about earlier. So when it comes to labor laws, the general idea, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but the general idea of labor laws that were passed after the war was to make la the labor market more liberal, uh, more flexible, um, with um, more types of different work contracts, not only permanent jobs, less reliant on uh, the public sector. Um, and also uh, part of these, uh, which was also linked to the what happened with the privatization, uh, was that there were a lot of people whose employment status at the end of the war was ambiguous because they uh, still technically had their jobs with a lot of these um, socialist era industries, um, but they hadn't been paid. And so they had been put on these waiting lists. Um, and while they were on the waiting list, they did not receive a salary, but their employer was at least supposed to pay pension contributions and healthcare contributions. 
Uh, however, this very often didn't happen. And so some of these laws were also used to set an expiration date for these waiting lists. So after a certain time, they would be uh, scrapped unless these people were rehired by their employers. However, this never really happened because partly also because of the privatization policy. So privatization was also another very controversial aspect of these economic reforms. Um, the international organizations were, of course, really pushing for um, privatizations and they pushed for a model where firms, industries were basically sold before being restructured. So even when they were um, poorly managed from the, um, the war or before the war or the industrial facilities like um, the buildings and uh, machinery and so on had been damaged, uh, they were sold before they were uh, actually restructured and put together. So this resulted also in a low value on selling and often it also resulted in um, people, uh, the people who bought these, uh, who uh, privatized the firms uh, were quite close to political elites and they ended up, they ended up stripping these factories of their assets and then abandoning them. So it, privatization, rather than becoming a way to recover industrial production and help the economy, uh, it ended up leaving post-industrial towns like uh, Zenica, but also other towns, like if we look, for example, at Tuzla, uh, also um, in, a, in, very, in a very dire state. And this also meant that some of these big privatization processes depended actually on foreign investors who came into Bosnia and bought some of these uh, firms. So this was the case of the mining company in Priador and the steel mill in Zenica that were partly bought off by uh, ArcelorMittal. Um, and in the certainly macroeconomic policy, uh, this was also um, uh, led by international organizations after the war with in the attempt to stabilize the economy. And so for this to happen, one of the things that they did was, for example, to establish um, uh, the new currency to help with the establishment of a new currency. As during the war, there were different currencies in circulation. Uh, and so they established the convertible mark uh, and they uh, packed the convertible mark to first to the German mark and then to the Euro. So the value of the convertible mark is fixed to the Euro. Um, they helped create the central bank, but at the same time, they also um, pushed through um, um, especially when uh, Bosnia started taking out loans from some of these financial institutions, um, they used conditionality attached to these loans to promote budget cuts uh, in the public sector and in uh, welfare. Uh, the welfare system was also completely changed. So each of these uh, types of policies, labor laws, privatization and macroeconomic policy, they, they affected legacies of socioeconomic violence. So labor laws did not give any sort of space to um, people from places like Priador and Zenica to claim um, rights related to their old jobs, like to be reinstated, compensation, which was also ridiculously um, limited and difficult, um, or labor rights, um, other types of labor rights. Um, in the case of privatization, it effectively dispossessed workers in the process. So these people who during socially, the socialist era had been, um, you know, had, because property was socially owned, they were invested, the whole community of the, the whole city effectively was invested in the success and the management of these factories. And these all ended with the war and with the privatizations. And macroeconomic policy, it led to, um, to cuts, it, and to uh, limit in the way the state could operate from an economic point of view, that then um, meant that a lot of the welfare support that was expected by people um, I spoke to in Prida and Zenica could never have materialized. Um, so even though these issues of economic reforms and post-war justice claims are taken to be uh, quite independent and separate, um, what I'm trying to show is that they're actually quite clearly connected. So now trying to conclude the lecture, um, what I've tried to show is that 
this political economy of the Bosnian war is important. So this political economy aspect, I think, is important not only to understand, to better understand the conflict itself, and also to avoid very simplistic accounts of the war that focus on essentializing aspects of um, ethnicity or religion, but also it's essential to understand violence and debates around justice issues. Uh, and so we have, in the case of Bosnia specifically, programs in um, the official transitional justice programs that are really not uh, well equipped to deal with the socioeconomic issues. And at the same time, we have a post-war economic reforms that are approved on the basis of criteria and inspired by principles of liberalization and marketization that do not, again, address the socioeconomic justice and in some cases end up reinforcing rather than ameliorating these conditions of injustice that the population was facing at the end of the war. Um, and really just as a last um, thing I want to say before concluding, um, that these also, um, what I do in the book and I think other people who have written about uh, these topics um, uh, also uh, show is that uh, the protest that there have been waves of protests of social mobilization linked to some of these socioeconomic issues. Uh, and again, we cannot really fully understand contemporary political developments in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and especially with respect to all of these social mobilizations like the 2014 protests without this account that puts um, political economy at its center. So that's the picture there is from, um, from a protest, uh, from a 1st of May protest in uh, Tuzla in 2015. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I hope it was not too much. Um, and I, I look forward to your questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Daniela. And then I want to give the students the opportunity to raise any issue. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I was uh, wondering what was the role of women like uh, in um, post war economy and uh, also during the war? Um, if compared, for example, to the um, treatment uh, towards uh, men um, who could be killed, imprisoned, um, in camps, and so on and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. That is a, this is a very good question. Thank you for asking that, um, because I've also been interested in this question and um, like written some things on on this question of gender and socioeconomic issues specifically. Um, so I would start by saying maybe a bit about the war. So during the war, um, it's true that most of the combatants in the war in Bosnia were men. So what happened was that um, they were normally called up by the army and so had to leave. And um, the, a lot of the people I spoke to who um, lost their jobs and were left to tackle this situation of very, for example, extreme material deprivation, lack of access to basic necessities like food in cities like Zenita were in fact women because men, men most of the men were away um, fighting. Um, at the same time, it was also uh, women were also targeted um, in wartime violence, even in these cities. Um, so even in the camps around Priador, it's not that only men were imprisoned. For example, in the, in the camps around the, around the city, like Omarska, Kera, Termendi, and Ternopolia. So some, in some of those camps, um, we also have, a, we, we had women imprisoned there and, um, and victims of, um, of sexual violence as well. Um, so they were, there was in fact this case uh, that I talk about in, um, in, the, in the chapter uh, that is on, that I shared with Roberto of a woman who was uh, also an employee in one of these firms and uh, who um, was, um, um, was warned, who's a, she was working actually as a nurse in a hospital and uh, one day she was warned not to go to work because 
if she had gone to work that day, they would have arrested her and brought her to a camp. And so the way she escaped being brought to the camp was by going into hiding that night instead of going into, into work. Um, when it comes to after the war, uh, the, what happened in the aftermath of the war from a gender point of view in, in, and socioeconomic issues in Bosnia is actually really interesting because Socialist Yugoslavia had promoted a model where, I guess, you know, gender inequalities clearly existed, uh, and but at the same time, women were also encouraged to take up um, paid jobs, and they worked in all of these industries, and they they participated quite actively actively to economic life. Um, but then after the war, many of them could not regain employment and we start seeing these differences uh, in uh, economic activity and unemployment between men and women. They become really remarkable. Uh, and a lot of the programs that then targeted women in terms of employment, for example, were all of these microcredit, for example, schemes. So if the other article that I sent to Roberto before today was a, is an article that talks precisely about this by Elena Stavreska that talks about microcredit and how microcredit was used in Bosnia was to um, because they, the international organizations preferred investing into the development of small enterprises and micro enterprises than um, investing into heavy industry. Uh, and a lot of these micro loans were given to women and in a lot of cases they ended up, they were uh, directed to activities that were considered to be traditional, traditional activities for women. So for example, um, knitting or, or, I don't know, opening hairdresser salons or other things that were, whereas before the war, you know, the socialist government had encouraged women to you know, go into jobs that, you know, they could be engineers, they could be working in the industrial sector. Uh, but we see after the war that these traditional gender stereotypes become a lot more relevant again, and that the international intervention actually um, in, you know, whether on purpose or not, but it, it does promote, again, this kind of very traditional gender stereotypes that have end up having uh, consequences for the uh, socioeconomic um, status of women after the war. I hope that makes sense as an answer. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, sorry, I have a question about something you wrote in your paper. Um, you said that uh, since many that came back didn't weren't able to find a job, but they are nowadays still going back and forth to Sansky Most, right? Mm. And I was wondering, uh, they are able to find a job in the Federation because of their current status as citizens that aren't treated equally or because there are better job opportunities? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so I think a bit of context on this is that when a lot of the people that were um, returning from um, be after being displaced during the war, so very often they ended up being displaced abroad, and then the countries where they were um, staying um, started asking people to leave and go back to Bosnia when Bosnia was again considered to be safe. However, this process of return generally didn't happen just like in one go. So people didn't just, you know, leave uh, Germany to go back to Priedor. Um, very often it was like a sort of back and forth. And in many cases there, were, there was an intermediate step. So people who were displaced from Priedor first uh, could not go back to Priador immediately because their homes were very often still occupied by Bosnian Serbs families who had 
um, started to live there during the war. So either their homes had been, say, destroyed, as it was the case, for example, in the old um, city uh, in neighborhood in Priador, or if they had left their house intact, then uh, Bosnian Serb families who had maybe uh, who were maybe uh, fleeing other parts of Bosnia had gone there and were living there. And it took a while, even though this commission I mentioned earlier uh, worked and adjudicated like hundreds of thousands of claims, it still took a while. And very often like this process uh, up until like the end of the 1990s, there were still many people who were um, trying to get back their uh, homes. So many of them in the meantime, having had to leave say um, Germany or other European countries where they had been uh, refugees during the war, they first went back to areas in the Federation because it was easier for them to, um, to because it, they couldn't go, go, go back to their hometown. So they, for example, in the case of Priador, they couldn't go back to Priador. And Saski Most is the, another sort of big, ish city in the same area but in the federation so they were it was a lot easier for bosnian muslim refugees to go there um, find temporary accommodation there try to look for a job there um, and if they found one it wasn't necessarily as easy to find then um, employment in priador after after the war and the political situation remained quite difficult for a, quite a while after after the war had ended. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Daniela, as the students perhaps gather their thoughts, I, I'd like to ask, to ask you um, a question, if you can help me um, understand a little more a point which, um, um, which I, do, I, I do not fully grasp, <laughs> that perhaps for my own limitations in political economy, I don't know. But um, so I... Um, so basically, I, I so that there are two issues that uh, it seems to me that uh, um, are very relevant for Bosnia and and actually for other countries in the region and perhaps elsewhere. I don't know, but certainly in the region, um, which um, on the one hand is the um, uh, the 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 political control of the economy. So the few jobs available are allocated through clientelistic and patronage networks. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the economy and international aid is used very often uh, um, as a tool to preserve political power or to acquire more political power, etc., etc. And uh, so that is certainly a problem because it is uh, perpetuating the power system and keeping nationalists uh, in power and also is hampering the development of a functioning economy. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that, uh, as you said today, um, and I and I agree for what it counts. <laughs> um, the the macroeconomic policies and, uh, and especially privatization have have reinforced the patterns of inequality. Um, because of the reasons you you, you mentioned that uh, firms were dismissed before they were restructured, uh, and so there was an opportunity to make more money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, but uh, it seemed to me that uh, perhaps the privatization. I mean, can we think of a way to privatize? So, in other words, or maybe privatize is not the right word, but, but how do you get the political elites, the oligarchs? out of controlling the economy because if you are perhaps privatization is if you really had a, a an economic system working through market principles instead of uh, instead of um, clientelistic and patronage rules uh, perhaps that would be very advisable so perhaps uh, 
a proper form of privatization would be very helpful. I mean, there is, a, for, for example, the energy company in uh, in um, in the federation uh, um, is uh, is a source of employment, corruption, and so on and so forth. So you should get the 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 SDA out of the energy company and privatize it. And that would be good for the economy and for the political system as well. So I think, I don't know if you agree. So how do you, I mean, privatization is bad, but also the political control of the economy is bad. How do you <laughs> square the situation? I don't know, I hope it's... Yeah, no, this is, that's a you put it really well i think you are right that on the one hand you do have this problem of like which is quite clear in bosnia but i agree it's also clear in other countries in the regions and and, and i think in other post-communist countries also in other parts of europe like in eastern europe uh, that where political elites managed to keep control of the economy this was not good it did not do any good to the economy and it also did not bring benefits, tangible benefits to the citizens in the end. It only benefited the elites, um, political and economic elites that were quite closely linked together. Um, however, at the same time, I'm not sure that privatization and full marketization is really the only alternative possible. I think that the privatizations that we saw in Bosnia and that we saw in other parts of the region and again in Eastern Europe at the time where the result of a belief in a, in a system where I, which I don't think, you know, even many of the people that proposed it then are now convinced that this was the best way to approach um, uh, the transition away from socialism. And I think that they, I mean, I don't want to sound really naive, but I do think that there are other options for ownership models that do not rely on full marketization, but at the same time allow firms not to be kept under this control of patronage networks and, uh, um, and political elites. I think that precisely because of the Yugoslav experience with um, socially owned property and self-management, they could have potentially um, experimented with other types of um, models that were based on cooperatives, for example, and that was a pol precise political choice so that that was not done because at the time the prevailing um, interest and in, uh, the prevailing uh, economic doctrine, I think, was very much that of you know, um, liberalizations and privatizations and carried out as quickly as possible would be the way in which these countries uh, will um, then turn into capitalist success stories, let's say. And the success stories in the end were quite limited to probably, I don't know, Poland in Eastern Europe, but definitely not the former Yugoslavia, yes. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, anyone? So Daniel, I, since we have a few minutes, I I, I like to ask you an, uh, one more question. Yes. I, because you 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 had this this great I think uh, research experience and field experience of um, spending a lot of time uh, in Bosnia and particularly in these two towns. And um, I, I wonder whether you can comment a little bit on. Um, I mean, you you met a lot of people who were victims of socioeconomic uh, injustice. I know that the word victi victimhood is, is a category that is, is questionable because it's too passive, etc. Et so I apologize for being a bit superficial on this, but, uh, but, but at any rate, certainly they suffered a lot from uh, and continue to suffer from socioeconomic justice. And, uh, and uh, actually the word victim brings to my mind that leads me to, to, to the question, how do you turn people who could be described as victims into true agents of change? I mean, mm. uh, there has been an attempt in, uh, in uh, 2014 to have a sort of a violent um, 
type of change and then the plan uh, plan on plan uh, um, and to develop a different type of politics and so on and so forth but that that seems long gone and I wonder whether on the basis of your experience uh, what kind of impression you do from these people in terms of their expectation how they think about political change, whether they think at all about political change or they only think about leaving Bosnia, as you know very well, a lot of people have been leaving for, for at least 10 years now. So what on the basis of your field experience, what kind of, um, what kind of, of, of conclusion are you able to draw from this? Mm. Yeah, I have to say that a lot of the people I spoke to, because I was speaking to uh, many of my interviews that lived and worked already during Yugoslavia, um, these were not largely, I guess, not young people. Uh, and there was a feeling that um, it was difficult for them to mobilize politically. But at the same time, especially in Zenica, many of them had actually taken part in a lot of these protests. Um, they had been part of these 2014 protests. Uh, they had also in Zanita again mobilized for this air pollution issue um, because the city up until 2012 didn't have any also measuring system uh, that could tell citizens, for example, how polluted the air was on a given day. Uh, and so it was as a result of social mobilization and protests that this was installed later. Um, but I think there was also a feeling that the younger generations were um, had to kind of lead on this kind of political change. What I think is, I guess that there are very big political obstacles to um, that citizens are very aware of these political obstacles. So I think that the question of how um, to bring about change for them is also very closely linked to the question of what to do with this political system of power sharing that was established in at Dayton. Uh, and so, for example, people, um, so a lot of the interviewees who were Bosnian Muslims um, in Priador, so living in Republika Srpska, felt that their ability to um, contribute politically and to influence um, the situation politically was very limited because of the system. Uh, and because of the fact that they were living in a in the Serb majority entity, um, and I, I'm sure, as you know, the question of how to reform Dayton and if Dayton should be reformed is a very controversial one, and one that is periodically had like a lot of attention, and now is one of those moments. I, I, I guess where it's getting some attention, and we we hear very dangerous proposals as well in terms of, for example, dividing the country um, on the basis of, um, of ethnic majorities in some areas, which I think are very dangerous political proposals and that really put the lives of the people I spoke to at risk in places like Priador. Um, so, so I don't know. I am generally speaking very interested in, like, and I talk to them and in the book, but also in other things I've written, I'm very interested in um, these attempts to bring about change from below, especially when these kind of mobilizations try to overcome uh, the limits of the system. So for example, this forced uh, um, um, uh, reliance on ethnicity as a way of kind of dividing people on the basis of, you know, politically dividing people on the basis of ethnicity. Uh, and I think that the, from that point of view, social mobilization in Bosnia is really uh, promising. But then at the same time, it kind of clashes with this system that is very rigid and very uh, difficult to change. And there is still no clear sense of whether it would be possible to change it and how it should be changed. Um, yeah. I'm also, I don't know even, you know, there is a lot of discussion around whether the European Union or international actors or the US should lead on this change of Dayton. Uh, and I'm also very skeptical of, especially given the proposals that we end up reading about in, in, in the media, uh, of how well, of, of how good of a job they would do. Um, yeah, and how fair is it to remove the control of this process away from Bosnian people once again, as it happened in Dayton.
Yeah. Okay, then, I'm sorry, I see a question. I don't know if you can see the chat actually, or if you do, if you don't, but uh, uh, maybe I can read the question for everyone. What okay. is the economic role of non Western states in the region? For example, China and Ra or Russia. Russia. Mm. Yeah, that is a very good question. I don't, I'm, I have to say, I'm not necessarily an expert on this topic. Um, I think that for, for political reasons, definitely political actors like in Republika Srpska, they try to align themselves with Russia. That's a very kind of convenient political strategy. Um, and the same is done by, um, you know, even Serbia itself, now not talking about Bosnia, tries to play this very careful kind of balancing um, diplomatic game between um, you, the ambition to uh, become a member of the European Union, while at the same time uh, trying to keep friendly relations with Russia. And we can see, I think, a very good example of that in the vaccination, uh, in the COVID-19, management of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine rollout in Serbia, that is really trying to gain them like, diplomatic uh, points with all of these different actors. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, like, I think that some of these other non-Western states, um, including not only China and Russia, but Turkey as well, are starting to play a more important economic role in the region. Um, but I would say that probably, especially in the case of Bosnia, the, it's still the most influential interlocutors, even in economic terms, remain um, the European Union and the US probably at this time. Uh, I'm sorry, may I ask just the very last question if possible? Um, yeah. You, um, you talked about how there's difficulties in promoting a uh, bottom-up approach. I wanted to ask you personally, if in your on-field research, did you have any difficulties um, for what you were doing? I mean, you, you took some positions, for example, against Arcelor Mittal. So maybe my question was, did you have some difficulties in what you were doing? Um, so uh, Arcelor Mittal so far has basically just ignored me. <laughs> so, I have actually, when I was doing field research, both in Zenita and in uh, Priador, I've tried numerous times to contact them uh, and to, to interview them to anyone from Arcelor Mittal. Um, and they've never ever replied to any of my requests. Whenever I've, like, I've even tried showing up in person in some places, uh, and they've always said, oh, you know, no, you should call this person and that person. And they've sent me around in circles, basically. Um, and then I have, though, tried to be a bit careful about, like, the way I write about this um, in, in the book and the way, like, I cannot attribute direct responsibility for certain things to them, right? Because um, I know that in other cases they have uh, um, given trouble to journalists, for example, who have written about Zenica uh, and the pollution, and uh, um, they've uh, kind of forced them to change uh, uh, journal art, like newspaper articles, um, because it was, I guess, giving them a um, bad, bad reputation. But I have not had problems directly with them yet, at least. So far, uh, that hasn't happened. Um, I think doing fieldwork in Bosnia was a uh, was definitely um, like it was really, of course, interesting experience. It was definitely made easier by the fact that I had uh, I traveled in the country for a while before I even began this project, and I had some contacts and I had people who um, who helped me. Um, but it's still. Um, it was still difficult to access certain um, certain interlocutors. Like for example, when I was in Priador, I tried to speak to um, as many people who were, you know, I tried to speak to, I did not select my interviewees on the basis of ethnicity. I, I made a conscious decision of not using ethnicity as a criterion for selecting interviewees. And also because I wanted to leave the possibility of to interviewees to define themselves in terms of their um, their identity. And I didn't want to, uh, to be uh, the one who labeling them in that respect. 
uh, but this also meant that in Priador, um, many people who would identify themselves as Bosnian Serbs did not want to speak to me. And it was a lot more difficult to have a, a Bosnian Serb interviewees and also to speak to organizations uh, that were linked to the government or, for example, uh, trade unions. Uh, who uh, just didn't want to speak to me when I was there. Uh, and I think in part it's because of the perception that uh, international researchers there will uh, be there to, to talk about the war in a way that is more sympathetic to the experiences of Bosnian Muslims in the area uh, than um, Bosnian Serbs, regardless of the fact that my topic of research focused more on socioeconomic issues than uh, um, say, for example, war crimes, but there was this perception and that made it a bit more difficult to, to find interlocutors in those groups. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> okay, what a, we, we are more or less out of time, but if there is a, one last question, I guess we can take it. Uh, okay. So, um, so we can conclude here then. Um, so, Daniela, really, thank you very much. It was very, very inspiring, very interesting, and um, and um, I did read your book, but I still. Took a lot of notes <laughs> as you were talking. Um, so no, seriously, that, that was the, the both the book and your presentation very uh, uh, stimulating. So thank you for being with us. And um, I just like to add for my students uh, to remind everyone there is no class next Wednesday because of a um, university is closed. Actually, not closed, but um, teaching is um, suspended for uh, because of the career day fair and then you have your own uh, final uh, in-class exam only for attending students uh, at uh, four o'clock next Thursday. Um, I think I'm done so I just again thank you Daniela thanks to the students and everyone else who connected uh, today. Thank you to, thank uh, you all good luck with your exam next week no the other <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, Daniela. Bye-bye, everyone, and see you soon. Bye. Bye.